Kalinsabay ng pagdiriwang ng pambansang buwan ng sining sa darating na Pebrero 2021, gugunitain ang Universidad ng Pilipinas ang dalawang mahahalagang enkwentro sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas, ang Diliman Commune noong 1971 at ang pagtatagpo ng Pilipinas at Espanya noong 1521. Niyahandog ng UP Diliman Opisina ng Chancellor at UP Diliman Office for Initiatives in Culture and the Arts, ang UP Diliman Arts and Culture Festival 2021. Enkwentro, barikada 50 at ikalimang daang taon ang pagtatagpo ng Pilipinas at Espanya. Nagaganapin mula Pebrero hanggang Abril 2021. Hinihimok ang mga scholar ng bayan na pagnilayan sa pamagitan ng mga proyektong pangsining at pangkultura ang mga pagtatagpo ng mga ideya at konsepto, palitan ng materyal at performatibong kultura, paglikha ng mga kolaborasyon na nagbibigay ng kritikal na perspektiba sa mga isyong pangkasaysayan at pandipunan, at pagsusulong ng mga talastasan ng mga manliksik, guro, mag-aaral at publiko. Sa kabilan ng suliraning pangkalusugan, ang mga gawaing nakahanay ay nakasandig sa mga gawaing akademiko suporta sa mga malikhaing gawa at pananaliksik ng mga kagaruan at estudyante, mga artista sa loob at labas ng universidad, at gayon din malay sa kapakanan o servisyong publiko. Sa pamamagitan ng mga gawain ito, may pagpapatuloy, hindi lamang ang dokumentasyon o pag-arkibo ng mga halagang datos, naratibo, malikhaing gawa at iba pang forma ng pananaliksik, kundi masisiguro rin ang tradisyon ng mapanuri, malusog at matalas na pakikipagtalastasan ng universidad tungkol sa mga usapin at isyong nasyonal at global. Ang mga proyekto na nakapaloob sa festival ay mga online webinars, forum conferences, virtual exhibitions, digital and multimedia performance, art installation mula sa iba't ibang kolehyo na nakikitaan ng interdisciplinaryong lapit mula sa iba't ibang disiplina. I-like at i-follow ang UP OICA sa Facebook, Twitter at Instagram para sa updates ng hashtag UPD Arts Culture Festival 2021. Maraming salamat po.
Good day everyone! Magandang araw po sa lahat and welcome to day one of Pagdiriwang, an online international conference on folklore and heritage. This year's Pagdiriwang marks the historic commemoration of the 500-year anniversary of the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines. Inspired by this rare occasion, this international conference on folklore and heritage will focus on how the church was made an organic part of the cultural and social lives of people from the Philippines and other parts of the globe. Pagdiriwang is organized by the UP College of Social Sciences and Philosophy's Folklore Studies Program. Through the support of the UP Office for Initiatives in Culture and the Arts and in solidarity with National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Pagdiriwang partners include UP Diliman Department of Anthropology, UP Aliguyan Folklorists, University of Santo Tomas Center for Theology, Religious Studies and Ethics, and De La Salle University College of Liberal Arts. To officially start the conference, let's hear from University of the Philippines President Attorney Danilo Concepcion. He will be followed by UP Diliman Chancellor Dr. Fidel Nimenzo, National Historical Commission of the Philippines Chairperson Dr. Rene Escalante, and the Dean of the UP College of Social Sciences and Philosophy and co-convener of Pagdiriwang, Dr. Maria Bernadette Abrera. To the organizers, resource speakers, scholars, and participants of the Pagdiriwang Ikalawa, Christianity and Popular Devotions, an international conference on folklore and heritage. To the UP officials, faculty, researchers, staff, and students. To Professor Maria Bernadette Abrera, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy. Sa inyong lahat, magandang araw po. I warmly welcome you to the second international conference of the Folklore Studies Program of the UPCSSP. This conference is part of the country's national quincentennial celebration in partnership with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and our many partners in the national and international community of scholars. As educators, learners, and leaders in shaping a better world, we are privileged to be part of this gathering of scholars in commemorating the 500 years of the presence of Christianity in our country. Through this event, we actively engage with one another in gathering, sharing, and producing new knowledge and gaining a broader, deeper understanding about the history and significance of Christianity and popular devotions. Not only does it help fulfill UP's leadership role, as a national and regional research and study center on folklore, this conference also helps in building the capabilities of its participants in shaping the future of humanity. This international event and conference is important to everyone because it commemorates a turning point in the history of our country and the world. That encounter 500 years ago between the natives of our archipelago and Spanish civilization linked our economic, social, and political development to the West. It also marks the circumnavigation of the world, which provided the empirical evidence that indeed the world is round, a fact which ushered in the modern world and a new age of geopolitics. But for our country, the significance of that encounter between Spain and our ancestors 500 years ago cannot be understated as our own everyday lives today are shaped by the impact of the arrival of Christianity to our shores. Around 92% of the Philippine population is Christian, with 81% belonging to the Catholic Church and around 11% belonging to Protestantism and other denominations. However, 500 years of Christianity's intermingling with indigenous beliefs and practices has led to the emergence of a folk Catholicism, a blend of Catholicism and indigenous animistic beliefs and practices 
that is uniquely Filipino. We also see this in the ordinary day-to-day -day practices of the people from the small religious icons and shrines set up in places of honor in neighborhoods, homes, and even vehicles to beloved traditions such as the Simbang Gabi during the Christmas season. It is appropriate then that this conference aims to highlight the social nature of folklore and cultural narratives and to continue exploring the legacy of colonialism and Christianity that Filipinos adopted, adapted, and retained, including the impacts on Philippine culture in comparison with other cultures. We will not only be discussing the traditional colonial, the indigenous, but also the counter-colonial aspects related to the Christian faith. We are excited to examine Eastern European Orthodox Christian popular devotions in Russia, Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, and from Western Europe, and the Christianity in France. Again, I wish to congratulate the organizers of this conference, the UPCSSP, through its Folklore Studies program, for this opportunity to deepen our understanding of our colonial experience and historical past. It is certainly in keeping with the legacy of Filipino historian, former UPCSSP faculty, and pioneering PhD Philippine Studies professor, Reynaldo Ileto. His seminal work, Passion and Revolution, first published in 1979, gave us a new understanding of the 1896 Philippine Revolution and our country's struggle for independence and identity through the Passion. The Passion is a religious document narrating in verse Christ's suffering and redemption of his flock using materials such as literary documents, poems, religious folk traditions, and rituals. The UP Folklore Studies Program and the CSSP's dedication and passion for sharing knowledge truly help in revitalizing the academic study of folklore. May you keep on leading the research and documentation of indigenous knowledge systems, cultural traditions, and producing new knowledge materials using new approaches and perspectives. I hope everyone enjoys this very interesting and lively conference. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. Magandang umaga sa lahat. Good morning to all. Welcome to all participants and organizers of this international conference on folklore and heritage. This online gathering takes place during our UP Diliman Arts and Culture Month and our quincentennial commemoration of the encounter between the Philippines and Spain. I'm happy to see that there continues to be great interest in folklore studies in our university. One can trace the roots of folklore scholarship in the Philippines to Isabella de los Reyes, who in March 1885 initiated a call for the creation of an archive of local knowledge in the Philippines. Brazil Mojares takes note of how de los Reyes' El Folklore Filipino published four years later in 1889, was a radical project which could be thought of as the founding moment of Philippine studies by Filipinos. Mujares himself takes a cue from De Los Reyes as he approaches the topic of folklore as a science by way of his collection of essays on Don Bellong's archival project published in 2013. I found out from Kaloy Tatel and Nin Sapalo that my father, Dodong Nemenso, had something to do with the establishment of UP Diliman's Folklore Studies program way back in 1980. He was then dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, which later broke up into three colleges, the College of Arts and Letters, the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, and the College of Science. The program was meant to encourage interaction among the departments and disciplines within the college. My father recalls that he initially urged the arts and sciences faculty to propose interdisciplinary projects. projects. He cites Dr. Damanio Eugenio, Filipino folklorist and professor at the Department of English and Comparative Literature, as rising up to that challenge. She was also later appointed, appointed as the program's first coordinator. 
Eugenio went on to produce a multi-volume compilation, the Philippine Folklore Literature Series, published by the UP Press. Among the uh, Folklore Studies Program's long-term goals included the creation of a national folklore archives, but its immediate task was to generate interest in Philippine folklore within the college as well as for the rest of the university. While the Folklore Studies Program has achieved much more since those days, I'll be happy to see the Folklore Studies Program transform into the UP Folklore Studies Center. With the help of the Department of Anthropology of the CSSP, I am confident that turning the FSP into an independent center would be the best way to institutionalize folklore scholarship and to honor the work of the UP folklorists and scholars who built this program many decades ago. The archiving works efforts of Isabella de los Reyes in the 1880s, as well as the establishment of the Folklore Studies Program in the 1980s, are both important steps that have contributed to where we are now in folklore scholarship in our country. May this conference continue to build, build on these notable achievements and others yet to be developed on this essential topic. Congratulations to the CSSP's Folklore Studies Program and all conference participants. Magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. We are all fortunate because it is in our generation that the 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world and the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines will be commemorated. Since elementary days, we are taught that the Magellan Elcano expedition reached our shores on March 16, 1521. This date is important because it started a period in our history that have tremendous effects on our political, economic, and cultural history. This year, there are three big organizations who are preparing commemorative activities, and each one is a preferred event that they want to highlight. The national government will focus on the victory of Lapu-Lapu and his men in the Battle of Macta. Spain, Portugal, and other countries where the expedition passed by will commemorate the anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world. And finally, the Catholic Church will give privilege to the first Easter Sunday Mass in Limasawa and the anniversary of the first baptism in Cebu. Collectively known as the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines, these milestones are better appreciated if we highlight their effects in our destiny and destination as a people. Like how the circumnavigation changed science and the entire humanity's understanding of our home planet, and at the same time motivated Spain to colonize thousands of islands in Asia Pacific and name it the Philippines, the victory of Mactan became a beacon of pride and dignity when our heroes founded the Philippine nation from 1896 to 1899. Similarly, Christianity changed our ancestors' worldviews, ancient belief systems, values, customs, and traditions. All of these are still manifested in our identity and cultural heritage. What do we mean with Pagdariwa? in the title of this academic gathering. For me, it is neither a celebration of colonization nor the discovery of the Philippines. It should be a celebration of our being and becoming. Christianity, in particular, is a legacy not only of the Spaniards but of our ancestors who appreciated it and made it as if it is their own. It evolved as the most dominant religion in our country, and it defines what we Filipinos are yesterday, 
today and in the next generations to come. More than a century since the Spaniards left our country, the faith remains vibrant and animates the nation. It is in this spirit that the National Centennial Committee and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines partnered with the Folklore Studies Program of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, in organizing this international conference on folklore and heritage in solidarity with the 2021 Centennial Commemorations in the Philippines. I wish this conference success and may you continue to project the trust of the National Centennial Committee, which is a Filipino-centric commemoration. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome everyone to this international conference on Christianity and popular devotions organized by the University of the Philippines Diliman College of Social Sciences and Philosophy Folklore Studies Program. The quincentennial celebrations that we hold this year bring us a unique opportunity to revisit our history and national experiences, rediscover and recover them. It is an opportunity for us to view back the Spanish colonial period of our history with the tools of analysis, perspective, and new researches that have emerged, especially in the last two decades, that have afforded us a refreshing take outside of the political confines by which historical events have traditionally been understood. From that previous political lens, we know of our anti-colonial struggle, of domination and oppression. But beyond nationalist historiography, centered on the political origins of national formation, and beginning with the cultural turn in the social sciences, we realize that so many of our experiences have been waylaid and marginalized or did not do justice to reflect the immense wealth of our culture and history. We are coming to give ourselves a more comprehensive account and retelling of our nation and our path to nationhood, not only to rediscover, but perhaps also to reconcile our nationalist aspirations with our cultural assimilations. Thus, we come to folklore studies as a heuristic device to help us discover, recover, reassess, recognize, reinterpret, what had been marginalized, understudied in our historical experience. Culture and the cultural experiences do not seamlessly fit into a political and politicalized narrative. We need to give it its own space so that it can link and be part of what we recognize as our continuing story of coming as a nation. This is a major part of what this conference seeks to highlight through the religious colonial legacy. That Christianity was assimilated in the popular mind and we can look to it to see the values and the aspirations that they cradle within the folk expression. These are the popular rituals that are the meeting points, the encounters, of cultures, contexts, and faith that mutually enrich each other. We have in this conference not only the Philippine experiences of Christianity through popular devotions, but also 
of the Orthodox Christians that will be provided by our colleagues from folklore groups in Eastern Europe. They are just as excited and interested in knowing about our own expression of Christianity, of Catholicism, that we have made our own. We have an excellent lineup in all our panels that will provide us these experiences, analysis, comparisons, and we will surely emerge all the more enriched with these presentations. So we are very thankful to the support provided to us by UP through UP President Danilo, Danilo Concepcion, UP Diliman through its Chancellor Fidel Nimenso, and the UP OICA through its Director Cecilia Santa Maria de la Paz, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, headed by the historian Rene Escalante. We open this conference now, and as I welcome everyone, I wish you all a very productive experience in this conference. Mabuhay! Thank you very much, Dr. Bernadette Abrera. Hello everyone, this is me and I am the project coordinator of Pagdiriwang. Before we start with the first panel of the conference, I would just like to remind everyone of our conference house rules. This conference is currently live streamed on Facebook through the Facebook pages of Pagdiriwang and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. We have a total of three panels for today, day one, and four panels for tomorrow, day two of the conference. Each conference panel will culminate in an open forum where participants and viewers may ask questions addressed to our panelists. You may ask your questions through the Zoom's Q&A feature as well as through the comment section of our live stream videos on Facebook. The moderators of each panel session will try their best to read the questions, but because we have limited time, we may not be able to cater to all questions. Pagdiriwang is free and open to everyone. If you would like to request for a certificate, you may go to our Facebook page to view the instructions. If you will post about the conference on your social media accounts or pages, please use the hashtag Pagdiriwang2021 so that we may be able to see and share them. Lastly, we'd like to remind everyone that the Zoom platform and live streams, as well as the comment sections on Facebook, are all safe spaces where we can share informed opinions and conversations. We request everyone to respect each other. Again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today in this online conference. We hope you enjoy and learn much from our panelists. Now we go on to open panel one. Let me introduce our moderator. She is assistant professor at the Department of History of University of the Philippines, Diliman. Here is Ms. Rhoda Wani Obias. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first session of this conference. I am your moderator, Roda Wani Obias. Now, before I begin introducing our speakers for this session, I'd like first to acknowledge our attendees who are joining us in Zoom, as well as those who are watching us from Facebook Live. So we begin our panel with three speakers and this session, as you will notice later on, is focused on the various expressions of piety. Our first speaker uh, reading his paper on historiography through Panata Cultural Performances, Collective Memory and Catholic Devotion. We have Dr. Sir Andril Pityatko, who is a professor at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Department of Speech, Communication and Theater Arts. He is the author of Bohol Bohol Entanglement, Contemporary Theater in the Metropolitan Manila, Performing Catholicism, Faith, Theater, and Ambivalence in a Philippine Province, which was a 2017 National Book Award finalist for Best Book on Art, and Cosmopolitanism, Theater in the Philippines, Performing Community in a World of Strangers, which won the 2019 NBA Best Book on Art. 
He's currently an associate editor of Humanities de Le Mans and a member of the Editorial Associates of Contemporary Theater Review. He will be followed by Dr. Manuel Victor Sapitula, who will, who will present his paper titled Understanding Mediated Piety in Philippine Modern Popular Religion. Dr. Sapitula obtained his PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore in 2013 specializing in the study of modern popular religion in the Philippines. He finished his bachelor and master's degree, degrees in sociology from the University of the Philippines de Liman in 2001 and 2006 respectively. He taught sociology of religion, sociological theory, and qualitative methods at the University of the Dil Philippines de Liman from 2005 to 2018. He is currently under formation in St. Vincent Seminary of the Congregation of the Mission, Vincentians, Philippine Province. Our last speaker for this session is Dr. Teresita Alcantara, whose paper titled A Comparison, A Comparison of the Christmas and New Year Celebrations in the Philippines and Spain, particularly in the cities of Marikina and Madrid. Dr. Alcantara is a professor of Spanish in the College of Arts and Letters, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She holds a doctorate degree in Spanish philology, linguistics, apto cum laude from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in Spain. She also has an MA in Spanish from the Instituto de Cultura Hispanica, also in Madrid, Spain, an MA in education, P Filipino language and literature from the Philippine Normal University, a bachelor's in secondary education from the National Teachers College and a diploma of specialization in Spanish from the Philippine Normal College. She's also a professional translator from Spanish to English and Filipino and English to Filipino and vice versa. Among the works she has translated are Platero y Yo of the famous Spanish writer poet Juan Ramon Jimenez, Nobel Prize winner in 1957, Memoria by Isabella de los Reyes, Impresiones by Antonio Luna, Origenes y Cosas de la Revolución Filipina by Juan Álvarez Guerra, and many more. Her doctoral dissertation entitled Los Hispanismos en, en los Medios de Comunicación Social Filipinos Estudio Lingüístico was published by the UP Centro Nanguigan Filipino together with its transla translation in Filipino. Let us welcome for today's session our three speakers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, magandang umaga sa lahat. Good morning po. Uh, maraming salamat sa pagpapakilala, Ms. Rodeline. And I'm glad to be part of this momentous event in the history of the Philippines, the commemoration of 500 years of Hispanic and Filipino relations. Okay, so bago po ako magsimula, I wish to congratulate the organizers of this international conference, uh, the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, particularly the Folklore Studies Program, the conveners, Dean Abrera, uh, Professor Tatel, and Professor Tuting Fernandez, uh, pasasalamat din kay Noreen sa kanyang mga email at sa kanyang mga reminder. You know, it could have been um, a, a very amazing uh, conference if we all physically met to discuss our insights on popular devotion. But this is still a wonderful virtual conference. I hope everyone is doing well amidst these very trying times. Anyhow, I'm here to present um, a study. Uh, I hope the there. So I'm here to present a study which I started in 2015. Um, the presentation is titled Historiography Through Pamamanata, um, Cultural Memory, Pre-Contact Performances in the Catholic Philippines. Um, here, I'm going to discuss three cultural performances. Uh, and these are cases in the proposal that through a deeper understanding of a cultural performance, this may allow an alternative framework on historical processes, and it may open up a remapping and reevaluation of the post-colonial world following embodied practices. So this year, 2021, marks the 500th year of Ferdinand Magellan's circumnavigation of the world, 
which as we know ended in Mactan Island in what is now known the Philippine Archipelago. Magellan's arrival in the Philippines is also the introduction of the colonial religion, Christianity. This year, the Philippines is also set to celebrate 500 years of Catholic faith via Spain's introduction of Christianity during colonization. Now, while the nation is anticipating the celebration of this glorious arrival of new faith, I found myself quite skeptical with regards to some sociocultural and social political implications that, in my view, must also be addressed during this momentous celebration. And of all the implications, I wish to focus how Catholicism through the annotations of the Hispanic friars altered the transmission of cultural memory and collective identity during colonization. The annotations of you know, the likes of Alcina, De Morga, Chirino, and other Hispanic friars about the islands during the colonial times were sent to the Hispanic monarchy and these annotations described the natives as performers of paganistic acts. Philippine theater historian Doreen Fernandez notes that these performances, while being reported to Spain as invocations to the pagan gods, are certainly the earliest forms of theaters in the islands. Not only these annotations misrepresented the performance traditions of the natives, but they also erased the worldviews and belief systems of the colonized communities by locking them into the archive. Now, this systematic archiving invented the concept of a mischievous and untrustworthy other. The natives, as Diana Taylor puts it in a very different context, though physically present, are acknowledged only to be disappeared in this act of writing or archiving. Colonization transformed presences into absences. They disappeared in the act of writing. Such transformation notwithstanding to the natives, the performances are what Taylor argues to be vital acts of transfer, transmitting social knowledge, memory, and a sense of identity through reiterated action. While the colonizers successfully transformed the indigenous religions. Next slide, please. Yeah. While the colonizers successfully transformed the indigenous religions of the post-colonial natives into the monotheistic Catholic faith, colonizers were never successful in suppressing the performative aspects of the pre-colonial religions. Today, these pre-colonial snippets continuously appear in different forms in many contemporary Catholic festivals through the performance of panata or pamamanata or sacrificial devotional acts that serve as pathways or perform of performers, meaning the devotees, to their almighty, commonly staged during the fiestas of local saints of the Catholic communities. Despite Catholicism as the theological root of these devotional practices, the origins of the pamamanata as told in the narratives, in the oral narratives, and commonly performed by the people through impassioned dancing, are attributed as cultural memories that somehow linked to the pre-contact era. As panata invoking cultural memories, these cultural performances, they comprise that body of reusable texts, images, um, and rituals specific to each society in each epoch whose cultivation serves to stabilize and convey that society's self-image. These performances open up a collective knowledge of the past based on the community's awareness of particularity. In other words, Panata assists in a retrospective construction of collective identity, and these Pamamanata embody religious supplications, but ethnographic data of the communities performing them and synoptically looking at the annotations of the Hispanic chroniclers revealed that these, performance, these performances also serve as reminders of cultural memories. An example is the Sinulog, a dance festival in the island of Cebu, uh, where the image of Santo Nino or Young Christ is held high in a choreographed dancing 
along the streets of Cebu City um, every January. Parading and dancing as a panata for about 10 kilometers and between three and five hours, the street dancing culminates in a competition where participating tribes led by a muse from the different towns of Cebu perform a sinulog days dance or a reenactment of the introduction of the venerated Nino in the island during the arrival of the conquistadors. Now, while a muse may be likened to a beauty pageant contestant, her participation is a panata, a prayer for a very personal intention, sometimes related to the quick recovery of a very sick loved one. The sacrifice, according to some informants, she is required to wear a heavy traditional costume and she is wearing a stiletto of three to five inches high. At the same time, she is required to carry the niño from the start of the street dance to the main competition with a movement demanding her not to bring the image down her waist. And then there is this popular lore in Cebu. Accordingly, slide please. Magellan himself gave Humabon's wife the image of the child, telling her to keep it in place of her idols, for it was in her memory of the Son of God. This was the first appearance of the Holy Child, and it was brief. Lost in translation, she mistook it for a figure or a representation of a child and began a dance consisting of a series of two steps forward and one step backward, which for the locals was the beginning of sinulog. Nonetheless, Cebuanos understand the term sinulog in two senses. First, sinulog literally means the current or the movement of the sea or the river. And secondly, a ritualistic and impassioned dance where parents present their kids, usually infants, holding them high as if presenting them to their gods in the heavens. Several Catholic Cebuanos I met during field work recall the movement as a memory of a very ancient past. Children were venerated and presented to their gods and goddesses. Some recognized the dance as the ancient Cebuanos' affinity to the waters, especially since Cebu is a Philippine province composed of 167 islands. Some informants even remark that every time they see the graceful movements of the Sinulog performers, especially the muses, they are reminded of the movement of the sea, a reminder of how the waters connected all islanders as a macro community and separated them from one smaller community to another during the pre-contact era. However, same informants believe that the dance speaks of a very Okay, so continuing, some informants even remark that every time they see the graceful movements of the Sinulog performers, um, especially the muses, they are reminded of the movement of the sea, a reminder of how the waters connected all islanders as a macro community and separated them from one smaller community to another during the pre-contact era. However, same informants believe that the dance speaks of a very distant past where despite differences, all islanders perform the same dance of veneration involving young children. Okay, 
My second example is in a palit in Central Luzon. The community performs an impassioned dancing in the river, locally known Libad, every June in honor of Apong Iru or St. Peter. As the image moves from its shrine to the streets, devotees begin their impassioned dance and water exchanges. Um, devotees sprinkle or throw water at everyone using pails, water hoses, glasses, plastic containers, or anything that you know holds water. The impassioned dancing continue in the Pampanga River as the image passes by the devotees gathered on both sides of the river, they spray and throw and splash water euphorically. The devotees never run out of water since the river is a never-ending source for the ecstatic water exchanges. This fluvial procession continues for about five hours. During the procession, devotees continue plunging into the water, dancing in pagodas, chanting and singing songs, and exchanging water. In addition, devotees throw food towards Apong Iru's pagoda and at each other. Filipinologist Gemma Pamintuan believes that the locals venerated crocodiles prior to the coming of Catholicism. Using as reference her keyword analysis of language in pre-colonial performance texts, and comparing it with Fray Diego Bergano's record accounts in his Vocabulario de la Lengua Pampanga. Um, slide, please. She concludes that the ritual festival, next slide na po, thank you. She concludes that the ritual festival may have its roots in a pre-colonial crocodile veneration. Pakibalik po. Some informants even claim, pakibalik po sa previous slides. Salamat po. Okay, anyway po. Um, some informants even claim that every time they participate in the ritual dancing and festive water exchanges, they are reminded of their elders who used to tell them that once upon a time, the Apollo community members were supplicating their nuno their local ancestral gods, to protect their village from the onslaught of their enemies, the dapu, or the ancient word for crocodiles. Today, there are no more crocodiles in the river, but food offering is still practiced. Surrogating the venerated crocodile to the Catholic image of St. Peter, performing a cultural memory of remembering how the community was saved from floodwaters on several occasions. And one final example is the Peña Francia in Naga City, performed every, every September for nine days. On the first day, a replica of the Lady of Peña Francia, locally called Ina, is brought out from its shrine to the 400-year-old Naga Cathedral. This transference is locally called traslacion, literally an act of transferring featuring an all-male ensemble called Voyadores. On the ninth and last day, the image is returned to its shrine following the Naga River route via a fluvial procession called regata. The Peña Francia seems to have normalized an understanding of masculinity as a privileged position. The Pamamanata pushes forward an ideology where women are represented as the opposite of toughness, courage, and strength. The normalization seems real because women devotees themselves fear to be part of a purportedly stampede caused by the performative chaos of translocating the image of Ina on ground on the first day and a combination of land and fluvial processions on the ninth and last day of the ritual and festival. Now, in the annotations um, of the Hispanic chroniclers, pre-colonial women of the archipelago, especially in the Visayas and in the Bicol region, had significant roles in religious ceremonies and oral cultures. One tradition is the Binukot, where women were veiled for protection and paraded to the local village as a manifestation of honor and pride. Fast forward to present day Naga. Veiling is no longer practiced, but protecting, guarding, parading, and carrying the woman before the public is still performed by community members. Nevertheless, 
a single woman through Ina substituted the Binukot in this Philippine region. This woman, like the pre-colonial Binukot, is now hailed as the most important woman of the community. Parading her onto the streets of Naga City and carrying her on the wagon and on the pagoda are extensions of the pre-colonial pre veneration, prestige, and protection. One in Foreman claims that Ina has to be placed on an andas because only the lowly can step into the dirty streets of Naga City. The Filipino Catholic communities continue to enact their own ritual narratives, supplementing and or opposing the narratives dictated by the official dogma. However, this is not a suggestion that Catholicism corrupted the indigenous religions of the various islands of the archipelago such as the communities discussed here, Cebu City, Apalit, and Naga City. The point is that, although the Philippines is predominantly a Catholic nation, the process of Christianization in the archipelago does not involve simply the imposition of Western culture onto local traditions, but rather highly variable processes of local reinterpretation and contestation. It is in this context, I say, that the communities discussed in the paper have made Christianity part of their cultures. What I presented is a preliminary proposition that performances are a manifestation of a cultural community in which the pre-colonial life ways of members are recuperated via expressive bodily movements. At the same time, the legacy of Hispanic Catholicism through Pamamanata is somehow decolonized by rearticulating an indigenous past. In the end, it is proposed that a deeper understanding of cultural performance allows an alternative framework on historical processes and opens up a remapping and reevaluation of the post colonial world, such as our country, the Philippines, following embodied practices. This alternative historiography, or the historiography through Pamamanata, posits performance more than a practice as a way of transmitting collective memory and communal identity. So marami salamat po. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my uh, presentation is uh, a project that I uh, did for my doctoral dissertation in sociology, focusing on Marian piety. So, and in 2014, in collaboration with um, another colleague working on communication and new media, uh, Dr. Chair Soriano, we, we um, came up with a study uh, about how uh, pieties, no, uh, popular religion, no, is uh, transformed when it is in the when it is brought no, to to uh, the online platform. So my presentation for today, understanding mediated piety in Philippine modern popular religion situates uh, the practice of uh, uh, rituals and prayers addressed to a divine figure uh, in the context of um, new technologies. No? So uh, next slide, please. The discussion that I will be having today focuses on three uh, major highlights of that, that uh, I have learned in the course of that uh, research. No? So the notion of mediated piety. Second is uh, devotional authenticity. And third, translocality. But before that, before we go into that, I would like to offer you a, a sort of like a context no? uh, as to how um, we have arrived at a um, nuanced understanding of these three um, major 
concepts which I will be discussing today. Next slide, please. The first is uh, regarding the paradox that concerns what we call online. Because um, studies on popular religion will usually um, uh, pit off, no? like uh, place popular religion alongside more institutional forms or more liturgical forms of uh, piety and practice, saying that while most of the institutionalized liturgical practices in Christianity and in other religions are mediated through the hierarchy, through the, for example, through the action of the priest, popular religion is more direct. You know? uh, scholar Michael Carroll actually says that popular religion is a direct contact with the sacred through materiality of, uh, of icons, through um, pilgrimages, no? performances involving the body, and uh, certain sanctifications of time. But what happens no? when that direct experience of the sacred is brought to online technologies, no? which again gives... Uh, raises questions about uh, the directness of the practices because this time we have an online platform that mediates that practice. So we will, uh, we will look into that later. The second is uh, the study is um, framed no? uh, in, the, in an exemplary case of urban shrine-based Catholic devotion. So first, it is um, an exemplary case. No? When, when one wants to study popular religion in the Philippines, there are actually many options to choose from. No? So the more popularly known um, icons and practices and devotions would include Santo Nino no? or the Black Nazarene. No? Or uh, these two will be the, the biggest no, in the Philippines. I, it, it, when I was starting my, my research, no, I intentionally um, distanced myself uh, from those, uh, primarily because there are already several studies done on them. I did a study on the Shrine of Our Mother of Perpetual Health in Baclaran, in Paranaque City. Now, so the, the choice was really because um, I did not find at that time a, an extended study of the, of, of, of the perpetual health devotion. And I was also um, oriented to that devotion earlier. No? So it's an exemplary case in the sense that among the hosts of a uh, Catholic popular religion in the Philippines, uh, there are, I, I used certain criteria in arriving at the choice of uh, our Mother of Perpetual Health. No? In the, um, the Our Mother of Perpetual Health devotion is a, a, a late, somewhat a late comer. No? If we pit it off against the more Hispanic forms of Marian piety, this was introduced in 1906 when the Redemptorists entered the Philippines. And um, the devotion to our Mother of Perpetual Health Start in, started in Baclaran only in 1932. And the, the, what gave uh, prominence to the Our Mother of Perpetual Health devotion is the Novena. We, they call it the Perpetual Novena Devotions, which only started in 1948 after the Second World War. So um, it's relatively recent. No? And because of that, it has a different character if you compare it with other forms of Marian piety, like the, the, more, the, the ones that were brought by the Spanish missionaries in the 16 and 1700s. It's also urban, uh, not intentionally, because when Baclaran Shrine started in 1932, it was actually not an urban area. No? In a way, urbanization caught up with it, and, uh, and the shrine had to contend with urbanization issues. No? 
which I documented in, in, in my dissertation. It's also shrine-based because uh, there are many forms actually of exercising the devotion, of performing the devotion, but I focused more of what happens in the shrine you know, as a privileged uh, platform, a privileged uh, place to conduct the devotion. So that's the second. The third is what is, I think, um, peculiar you know, to, to, to the perpetual health devotion in the context of the other devotions in Catholic Philippines is that there are epistolary mechanisms of devotional maintenance. What does that mean? Epistolary mechanisms is the writing of letters. So um, in, in the perpetual health devotion, uh, devotees write a lot of letters. So they would write at least two, one letter of petition and one letter of thanksgiving. You know? So in the course of time, the Redemptorist Fathers have actually collected some of these letters and I have had access to letters as early as 1948 until um, around the time I was doing my dissertation in 2008. And uh, as I continued studying it, I even like extended uh, the, the analysis of the letters beyond 2008. So th those are the contexts. No? But I would also like to, to like introduce reflections about how online piety is utilized in the context of the present pandemic. It suddenly became a very prominent form of devotion and uh, worship. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's, it, what's with medi mediated piety? You know? The central issue that I want to um, discuss here is the impact of online religion in the social character of worship. You know? So, there, I, I would like to emphasize the term online religion no? because um, scholars on um, religion and media no? make a distinction between religion online and online religion. Religion online mean, simply means that denominations, churches, mosques, and religious communities would simply place uh, a website of their community on the internet so that... Uh, outsiders can be guided about about the times for worship you no know, the address you no know, it's it's more of like inform information dissemination that is religion online online religion is the performance of religious rituals in virtual space so the the, the issue that i want to really tackle is the impact of online religion which means religion practice in the virtual space in the social character of worship, which uh, yields uh, questions like, in what ways may online religion enhance existing relationships or create new enduring relationships? We're dealing with a different platform. So in what ways can the, that platform enhance existing relationships, create new enduring relationships, or destroy existing relationships if possible. No? Or if, uh, the second question is, under what conditions may online religion be conceived as authentic or dystopic expressions of religious practice? So that is um, the, the two central questions that I would like to deal with in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. When I studied the, when we studied the, per, the perpetual health devotion uh, in 2014, in its online, um, in its online platforms, no, um, the first thing we had to look at is the website. No? The website that you see now is the website now. It, it was a very different website in 2014. But I'd like to call your attention to like um, the multimedia resources that the, the shrine offers. No? So like uh, someone who wants to perform the devotion can resort to videos of, uh, the, of the, novena, uh, the novenas in the shrine. They can write letters online. They can, um, they can follow the novena through live stream and forms like this. This was done even before the pandemic. No? Um, 
we will discuss it later in translocality. But uh, what I'd like to uh, focus here is um, the readiness no, of this particular mode of devotion in employing or using the online space, no, even encouraging it. Next slide, please. In the context of the pandemic, we have uh, communities like um, parishes no, conducting virtual uh, coverage of their religious services. So this is an example of uh, the way of the cross done by Santuario de San Vicente de Paul. No? Um, it's, uh, it's, on in, it's, it's uh, live streamed on Facebook. The other one, next slide please, is the use of um, online masses no? in the context of the pandemic because uh, of the limitations of physical movement. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. In the in, in, in the study of uh, of these particular forms of religious practice, I found that mediated pieties, uh, such as the ones that I mentioned to you, intend to simulate offline religious experience. And I'd like to call attention to the word simulate. What does it mean to simulate? To simulate is initiate the appearance of or character of something. And it does, uh, it, among social scientists and philosophers, we are immediately reminded of Jean Baudrillard's notion of simulacra in his conception of like uh, in the, in the postmodern world, everything becomes hyper real. And the simulacra is like a copy of the real wherein you cannot distinguish what is real and what is the copy. So here, um, there is still an allusion to um, the distinction between the offline, which is supposed to be the, the main uh, practice, and the mediated ones in the, online, in, in, in the online platforms. The second is the role of innovation and imagination. You know? um, uh, Dr. Tiatko mentioned earlier that contestations in popular piety are uh, are present, no? Uh, it's not simply a, a, an acceptance of uh, what is imposed. In online popular religion, that appears, no? In how devotees innovate and imagine the practices differently, uh, different from the intention of the framers or the regulators of piety. And third, uh, mediated piety reconfigures notion of time, togetherness, hierarchies, and regulation, no? giving um, giving a uh, a diff, uh, uh, an alternative things of time, for example. So it's not bound by um, a specific time because you can always access it. Togetherness, now what forms of togetherness are are available? No? if um, you meet in a virtual platform, not only amongst devotees, but between the devotee and the divine figure. In this context, the Virgin Mary, uh, as um, venerated as an icon. No? Hierarchies, no? how are hierarchies respected and subverted in virtual space? No? So for example, you have, um, because of innovations, no? um, devotees can perform the rituals in a different way, no? in different ways that uh, are not anticipated uh, by the by the by the ones who produce you know, the offline religious contents. No? Next slide, please. The next is about authenticity. No? Authenticity refers to the quality no, of, of devotional um, practice that is centered on human and not merely ritual considerations and factors. A word about authenticity. Uh, is authenticity in our context when it is used by social scientists a value judgment of a practice? No? So because scientists to actually make value judgments about whether a practice is authentic or not. But uh, I don't use authenticity in that sense. No? What we mean is that in the experience of the devotees, how do they account for the authenticity of their own experience? 
And it is here that the interiority, no? which is, um, which is um, highlighted in our use of loob and kalooban, is an important arbiter of devotional authenticity, which means to say that uh, it has to resonate personally to the individual for the, for, for the devotion to be authentic. It has to be interior. It's not merely ritual, but it is something that is internalized no? uh, in the context of a person's life. Now, that's why it's a mechanism for the personalization of religious experience. Next slide, please. So in the letters, in the devotional letters that I've read, some 900 of them, the devotees, whether using the offline or the online platforms, uh, use um, loob or kalooban as a central theme of their devo devotion to, to the Virgin Mary. No? They speak of utang na loob. They speak of pagbabalik loob. No? They speak of kapayapaan ng loob. No? And this, does not, uh, this did not uh, differ significantly whether they use online or offline platforms. So I, to the, regarding the question, is loob still a significant indicator of devotional authenticity if it is practiced online? The answer is yes. No? There is still that same uh, expectation of interiority. No? even if the, the, the platform is already online. So the, the expectation for authenticity stays. No? So next slide, please. Translocality. No? So this one from the authenticity of Loob. No? Translocality is the, 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 the um, notion that revolves around mobility, connectedness, networks, places, localities, and locals, flows, travel, transfer, and circulatory knowledge. It is important to discuss translocality in, in online uh, pieties because it challenges defined boundaries. And one of the defined boundaries that I have dealt with is the shrine, because the shrine is physical space. When um, the, the devotion was placed online, it somewhat challenged the defined the defined boundaries of a shrine, no. So, and uh, particularly with the management of identities in the context of movements and the use of media technologies in the circulation of knowledge. So, how devotees handle uh, knowledge and practices. No? So, like it has to assume a translocal flavor. It's not just about the shrine. In a way, the shrine has to be transposed elsewhere so that its experience would appear much, much closer to the devotees, even if in the absence of, the, of going to the actual physical shrine. So, because the issue here is that if the boundaries are becoming more fluid and the field becomes less geographic, how are ties maintained? No? So, it is in this context, next slide please, that notions of pakikipagkapwa, no? uh, kapwa, or the, 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 the near other, no? figures prominently in, uh, in, in um, online popular religion. No? Specifically, with regards to the uh, expression of um, uh, the relationship between the divine figure and the devotee. And online and social media platforms redefine the notions of closeness and acts as a bridge for new ways of performing the devotional relationship. And lastly, online religion keeps those physically unable to be present, physically present, to be part of a broader imagined community of devotees. So it, it allows the devotees to kumbaga, cover for the, the distance no? and the, the, the porosity of the boundaries that exist between the shrine and outside the shrine. So where the physicality or the geographic uh, entity is somewhat downplayed, the devotees um, compensate by uh, alluding to personal networks found in Pakipagkapwa. No? To conclude, next slide please. So just to like respond to the questions that I have posed earlier. No? So, 
the first uh, insight that I'd like to offer is that uh, there is an active role of the internet and social media technologies in crafting the continued relevance of religion. So here we say that um, instead of uh, online platforms somewhat downgrading religion as a mere simulacra or like copy of the real, um, we distance from that interpretation and say that actually internet and social forms for enacting authentic, you know, perceived to be authentic forms of piety. The second is that the social dimension of loob and kapwa in our Filipino cultural psychology conditions devotees' engagements with institutional agents. So it, uh, it, the loob and kapwa are, um, are uh, means for the devotee to continue exercising connections out within, between himself or herself and other agents in the de performance of devotions. And lastly, live stream of prayers and online facilities for expressing religious sentiments do not negate the authenticity and reciprocity of religious practice. It's just that methodologically speaking, we will have to find a way you know, of, uh, start of looking, what do we look into when we want to study authenticity and reciprocity? In the context of the popular health devotion, there are the letters. That, that's why the pandemic you, the, the use of online and media technologies in the context of the pandemic will be a challenge because what will be used as indicators of authenticity and reciprocity, which can be open for further discussion later. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Muy buenos dias a todos. Magandang umaga po. 500 years ago, Ferdinand Magellan claimed the 7,200 islands and islands for the Spanish uh, Empire. For four centuries, Spain ruled us but left many legacies that were significant of which is Christianity. Spain Christianized us and made us the only Christian nation in Asia. From this religion, we learned many celebrations, but the most loved by Filipinos are the Christmas and New Year celebrations. These two occasions are well celebrated in the whole Christendom. But today, please allow me to share with you the Christmases and New Year celebrations I saw and experienced in my native Marikina compared to the Christmases and New Year's I saw and experienced in Madrid, Spain during my three years of master's studies and five years for my doctorate and a total of eight years. Let's begin with the free Christmas activities. Slide, please. In the Philippines, as early as October, we begin to hang the parole or Christmas lanterns with blinking Christmas lights. We decorate our homes with Christmas tree, a balloon set, and other Christmas decors while we hear Christmas songs on the radio. Our local go government decorate the lamppost on main streets with Christmas lanterns. By November, the changes begin, which is like a flea market. And on December, the schools usually end the classes by a lantern parade and lantern contest. Carolings also begin while vendors selling their Christmas dainties to put to home in the special building begin selling. In Spain, Christmas is also felt as early as October. Here they begin to sell Christmas dainties or sweets in supermarkets, groceries, and other food shops. If we have the putumbong and the bebinka, there they have the torones of different kinds like toron duro, toron blanco, etc. These torones are made up of almonds, honey, milk, and other ingredients. Almonds are very essential during Christmas. There is the natural almond, toasted almond, or the crushed ones. The most special torones and chocolates are those made by the Nas of Veronica de Constantine. We also have the sapan, which, which comes in different shapes like fish, animals, etc. And also mantecados, 
Rosco and the special polvorones made by the mass of St. Clair of the town of Estepa. For the Spanish families who cannot afford to buy these dainties, their parish church and the different organizations give them these items free as Christmas gift because the Spaniards want to see that everybody will have those dainties on Christmas. By late November, they begin to decorate all the streets with bulbs of different colors and Christmas lights. I saw how the Plaza de España in Madrid was filled with lots and lots of bright Christmas bulbs as if it was daylight and on the entire, on the entire plaza. They don't have Christmas lanterns like we do. Uh, at, at the Plaza Mayor also, they hold the Tiangue, where they sell Christmas uh, balance sets, Christmas decors, and other images of saints. In the Philippines, we see, we have here carolers and carolines. In Spain, they have choral groups holding Christmas concerts in different churches, which are open to the public and entrance is free. They don't sing famous Christmas songs in English. They only, they only sing Spanish and Latin Christmas carols. For us, the Christmas tree is the primary symbol of Christmas. There it is only secondary. The number one symbol of Christmas is the Belen set that is exhibited everywhere aside from private homes. All the churches have the Belen set, not in the altar like here, but on the one side of the church because their set needs a big space. When I was there, I loved walking from one church to another to see those Christmas villages or Belen sets. One Christmas season, the city government put up a press presentation of a live Belen at the Retiro Park. It was live because the couple Saints Joseph and Mary, the shepherds, the three kings, the three camels, and other animals were real people and animals. Only the baby Jesus lying in the manger was not live. It is the big image of the, Holy, of the baby Jesus that we see in the church. The exhibit lasted only for a week and was done only for a few hours because it gets very cold in, as the night advances, being winter in the Spanish capital. The official start of Christmas. In the Philippines, Christmas begins officially on December 16 with the Misa de Gallio and the Dina Mass for nine days to honor the Virgin Mary. It is additionally done due, uh, at, at 4 a.m., time of the crowing of the roosters. It was translated to Filipino as Simbangabi, meaning hearing mass at night, because 4 a.m. in the Philippines in December is still very dark at that time. But during martial law, curfew was imposed from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Therefore, the Misa de Gallo cannot be done. So the church, instead of beginning at the dawn of December 16, began it on the night of December 15 after dinner and retained its name Simbangabi. This time, the, the term became more appropriate because it's really hearing mass at night. After martial law, the Misa de Gallo was restored, but the Simbangabi continued. So now, we can choose the Christmas novena that we want to attend, uh, either the Simbangabi or the Misa de Gallo. After the Mass, the tradition was to buy the delicious Christmas dainties, the puto bumbong, and the baby sold by different stalls in the church patio. The Misa de Gallo ends on December 23, and on December 24, Christmas Eve, the celebration begins. We call this day Noche Buena, a Spanish term meaning good night. Uh, slide, please. Uh, but uh, this term was never translated to Filipino and instead was Filipinized by spelling the word according to the old Filipino alphabet. In the afternoon of this day, the, the people become very busy preparing the food to be eaten at night. By 7 p.m., the Marikenos begin to line up the sidewalk to wait for the passing of the Panawagan or Panuluyan in other places of the country. The Panawagan is like a reenactment of the night when the couples Joseph and Mary knocked on some houses in Bethlehem to find a place where the pregnant Mary could give birth to her child. It is a procession coming from our parish church of, of San Antonio de Padua. Like an, ordi an ordinary procession, there are two lines of people on left and side on left and right side holding candles in the middle we see a couple walking dressed in the attire of saint joseph and mary and by the end of the line we see a float decorated and well lighted carrying the images of the holy couple following them is an orchestra the procession passes on the different streets of the city then it stops before some Selected beautiful houses with a veranda at the second floor, and the ceremony of the Panawagan begins. A man dressed in the attire of a rich man during the time of Jesus appears in the veranda. He plays the role of the house owner. 
the orchestra begins to play, accompanying Joseph and Mary, while singing their supplication to the house owner to give them a place where Mary can give birth. The house owner will answer by, say, by asking, Sino ba kayo at taga saan? Who are you and from where are you? The couple will answer by saying, Kami po yung magkasisinta na si Jose at Maria, meaning their husband and wife, Joseph and Mary from Nazareth. They will repeat the request, but the owner will say, Hindi mangyaya. Ang bahay na ito ay para sa mayayaman lang. Meaning, no way, this house is only for the rich. Two or more supplications and the couple will bid goodbye. Throughout the ceremony, the couple sing their lines. Only one or two times will they answer without singing. The house owner, the house owner on the other hand, says his line most of the time without singing. He sings his line only one or two times. The procession continues on their way to the next selected house and everything is repeated. By 10 p.m., the procession returns to the church for the Misa de Galileo. And this time, the house owner is with his wife and son, both dressed like rich people. As usual, the rich man will reject the couple, but the son will, and the wife will convince the own, the master, the, the head of the family, the man, to accept Joseph and Mary, and the son will lead Joseph and Mary to any path built near the altar. The couple stay there and the day be Jesus in the form of our regular Santo Nino will be laid in the manger. Then the big star on the top of the hat and the blinking Christmas lights will be turned on and the mass begins. After the, the mass, the people rush to their respective houses for the Noche Buena meal. At 12 midnight, like all other families, we take our Noche Buena too. We have the traditional ham and queso de bola and other meat dishes like morcon and the famous marquilla dishes called Wacnato and the everlasting uh, and other special foods. In Spain, I stayed at the dormitory of the Dominican missionaries. One day in December, I asked one of the nuns about the Misa de Gallo and she said it is not done in Spain, but she saw it in Mexico when she was there for a mission. Her answer made me recall our history that Spain ruled the Philippines through Mexico due to the great distance between this archipelago and the Iberian Peninsula. The Mexicans brought it here who were then under Spain too. Christmas in Spain begins officially on December 24, Christmas Eve, just like here. On the night of December 24, is a very special night for them. They also prepare a lot of special foods for the Noche Buena. Here we prepare meat dishes. There it must be fish. The menu is usually bacalao with potatoes and cauliflower and also seafoods. It won't be Christmas for them unless they have fish and seafoods on the table. For dessert, they have their toron and masapan and of course champagne and other special ones. The Noche Buena meal for them is not 12 midnight like here in the Philippines. The Noche Buena for them is a family dinner taken during their regular dinner time which is very late, 10 p.m. Because during summer, the sun sets there at 10 p.m. All their meals are late compared to, our, our, to us here. Lunch there is 2 p.m. Well, breakfast is 9 a.m. On the other hand, maybe during the Spanish period here, the Filipinos or the Spaniards taking their dinner too late, so they thought that the Noche Buena should be taken at 12 midnight. After the Noche Buena, they go to the church to hear the Mass, then return home or stay. They don't have there the Panawagan or Panuluyan. This is also unknown to them. I learned too from the Dominican sisters that this is a Mexican tradition called Posadas which means an inn or a place where travelers can rent for a brief stay. On December 25, uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, particularly in Marikina, in the morning of December 25, we see many children walking on the street, wearing their new dress, shoes, and belts. They visit their godparents and relatives to kiss their hands as a way of greeting the Merry Christmas. The godparents give rough gifts to their godchildren, while the other children are usually given money. But for my other relatives, they prefer to give suman to all their folks and friends. They prepare suman marikina style made of glutinous rice, wrapped in banana leaves with a triangle shape and cooked in coconut milk. Lunch this day for our family is also special, while well, big families prepare lots of food especially one whole lechon for their family reunion. The whole day of Christmas is spent by changing this and eating a lot of food. In Spain, on December 25, the people wake up late because they go to bed late. They begin to go out late in the afternoon. They don't give Christmas gifts on Christmas Day like we do. Uh, and then on New Year's Eve, December 31, in the Philippines, uh, roll please. In the Philippines, uh, New Year's Eve, December 31, we call it Medianoche. 
It means one half old night and one half new night. Like on Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve is also a lot of food preparation for Filipinos. Before 8 p.m., we go to the church to hear mass while some neighbors begin to light firecrackers. At, at 11.45 p.m., the sounds of firecrackers around us become louder and louder and louder until 10 minutes after the new year has entered. After welcoming the new year, we take the special Medjano Chimil. In this new millennium, we have added a new year's practice. This time coming from the Chinese, we display on the table different kinds of brown fruits like grapes, etc. to bring good luck for the new year. In Spain, New Year's Eve is called Noche Vieja, old night and not media noche. On Noche Vieja, they don't prepare a lot of food. Why? Because they go to restaurants for dinner to meet the new year and stay all night. But for the senior citizens who cannot go out anymore, they stay at home and prepare a special dinner. They usually have seafoods, roasted meat, empanada, oven roasted fish, oven cooked fish like Merlot Saraliana, and Toronis Masaparis, and of course, wines and champagne. The young ones go to the famous Puerta del Sol, the center of the city of Madrid. This plaza is surrounded by buildings and one of them is City Hall with a giant clock on the top that has a very important role during New Year. One New Year's Eve, my dormmates brought me to the Puerta del Sol to meet the New Year and to experience the New Year's edition called Doce Ubas. We brought with us 12 was grapes and by 10 p.m. we were there. There was a show from the balcony of the City Hall hosted by a famous actor and actress. At 12 seconds before 12 midnight, the big bell begins to toll, and for every toll, we should eat one grape until we finish all at exactly 12 midnight. After that, they shouted, Feliz Año Nuevo. They believe that you will be lucky if you were able to finish eating the 12 grapes on time. Then it is followed by a glass of champagne. This event is televised worldwide so that those who cannot come to Puerto del Sol can follow the practice. And after uh, the Dosi Ubas, the fireworks display comes from the back of the city hall. And later, the, the program continues. The people stay out to celebrate the night. They don't go home until almost sunrise, in spite of the low temperature. They do a lot of drinking and merry makings, while those at home are glued on television while taking their, champ their champagne and wines and torones and masapanes. The fireworks display we saw at the back of the city hall were the only fireworks lighted. The whole city is quiet and fireworks free. On New Year's Day in the Philippines, we usually wake up late because we went to bed late. Again, we have a special lunch like the Marikina style chicken with pineapple, uh, cocido mariqueño, etc. After lunch, we take a sieta in the light afternoon, we go to other families. If they had done their Christmas reunions on Christmas Day, they go swimming or go on. Excursion. In Spain, on New Year's Day, the city is like a ghost town because the people are still asleep. There is complete absence of movement and life resumes only in the early evening when people begin to go out. After New Year in the Philippines, in our city and all parts of the country, the Sunday following the New Year is declared by the Church as the Feast of the Three Kings. We hear Mass and then rest for the following day to work. And this way, the Christmas holidays in the Philippines end. In Spain, however, the Yuletide season continues because they have another feast day to celebrate. This time, the feast of the three kings, Melchor, Gaspar, and Baltasar on January 6th. In the morning of January 5, the eve of the feast, people visit bakeries and pastries to buy their, ten, their dainty for the three kings called Roscon de Reyes. It is a bread called like snake, so the form is round. It has confectionery fruits as decoration on the center of the circle, while on the other circles they put confectionery sugar. People buy this for their family or to be given as a gift to their families. This is the time of the year when they give and, and exchange gifts. Of course, the center of the gift givings are the children who believe that they receive regalo de reyes or gift from the three kings instead of gift from the Santa Claus or Papa Noel as they call it there, like the belief of our children here. In the early evening of the same day, January 5, people, especially children, begin to, begin to line up on sidewalks of many streets in Madrid, like the Paseo de Castellana, Calle de Alcala, Gran Vía, etc., to watch the mass awaited three kings parade, which they call Cabalgata de Reyes. It begins at Parque de Retiro and ends up the Plaza Mayor. It's a very beautiful 
parade with, lo- with flows, apron flies, musical bands, military men riding in tall horses, three men dressed as three kings, like real kings in the olden days, and each riding on their well-decorated camels followed by entourage like in the time of Jesus. Some men of these kings carry a wooden basket in their back full of gifts which they give away to the shouting children. It is worth lining up on the sidewalk and wait for the parade in spite of the very cold weather. I'd find it very beautiful, as beautiful as the parade I saw in Disneyland or even more beautiful. On January 6th, the Feast of the Kings, everybody eat the, the, the Roscon de Reyes while children receive their gifts and begin playing with the toys they got. And in the afternoon, usually, people go out. In this way, the holiday season in Madrid and Spain end. From Spain, we learned to celebrate Christmas and the New Year. Although we made some changes in the manner of celebration of, the, of our Christmas practices, we inherited from because of the other Christmas practices we inherited, we inherited from others like the Mexicans, the Americans, and the Chinese. We got the Misa de Gallo and the Posadas from, the, from Mexico, the Christmas tree and Santa Claus and carolings and Christmas carols from U.S., the lighting of firecrackers and buying grounds from, from, from China. But there is one Christmas practice I corrected in our family, that is instead of taking the Rashiwen at 12 midnight, we now take it at our regular dinner time for our own health too. On the other hand, the person pandemic changed many of our practices and the big economic crisis by this calamity. But with or without pandemic, with or without economic crisis, the Filipinos, young and old, rich and poor, will surely celebrate Christmas and the New Year. Thank you, Spain, for this great legacy. Viva Filipinas, viva España. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank our three speakers from this morning session. We had Dr. Tiatko, Dr. Sapitala, and also Dr. Alcantara. We are opening the floor for questions and answers. If you are joining us here at Zoom, you may type in your questions in the Q&A form, but please indicate your name and your institutional affiliation. If you are watching us through Facebook, We also have committee members who are on standby there, so you can also ask us questions over there. All right. Um, All right. Uh, I guess while people are still formulating their questions, let me just um, summarize very quickly the papers that we just heard from Dr. Tiatko's paper. We saw how he interrogated the idea of Pangamanata And he argued that this was a way for us to transmit collective memory. Now, the three examples that he showed us was Sinulog in Cebu, Libad in Pampanga, Peña Francia in Bicol. Now, in the end, he asserts that the process of Catholicism is much more complex. And we must take into account that it was not simply imposition, but we also have to look at how local interpretations and negotiations come into play. Now, our second paper from Dr. Sapitala uh, interrogates the authenticity of piety, essentially uh, from online religion. Now, he argues that uh, online religion actually enacts the authentic forms of piety uh, and that uh, the concepts of loob and kapwa are means for us to continue exercising uh, our piety. So because uh, it allows the devotee to continue to establish connections with himself as well as with the institutions and other individuals. Now, in the end, live streaming does not negate religiosity. Now, the final paper from Dr. Alcantara, she shared with us very interesting vignettes of her experience both here in Marikina as well as in Madrid, comparing and contrasting uh, two particular religious practices, Christmas and New Year. And she showed us how um, this differed, oh well, how we received this 
legacies from not only Spain, but as well from Mexico, China, and also the Americans. Okay, now we have one question or there's another one. Okay, so let me begin with the Q&A question. This is addressed to Dr. Sapitola. Good morning. Uh, let me just read this. Good morning, Paul. I'm a student from Bicol University College of Arts and Letters, Literature Department. My question is for Dr. Sapitola. I want to ask your opinion on the, the perpetual devotion. You mentioned that many people are degrading culture religion. Some are saying that this kind of devotion blinds people's reliance. What can you say, Paul, about people who are saying that this devotion is one of the lowest forms that degenerate into heat? Fanaticism. Yes, uh, actually, that comment, you will find that comment uh, making rounds in social media, especially after, during January 9, the feast of the Black Nazarene. So that is where the, 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 it's framed in religious uh, uh, discourse as well that. Uh, the worship of idols, worship of statues. You know? So it's it is an anti-Catholic slur. You know? From the point of view of uh, the social of social science uh, scholarship, we don't actually judge um, uh, people's uh, practices in terms of fanaticism and uh, idolatry. You know, those are those categories are quite foreign to the usage of social scientists. That's why. The, the, the safer term to use is authenticity you know? and uh, to, 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 to you to frame it in terms of like of, of is the devotion a, a, an authentic exercise we will have to invoke the how the individual or how the devotee you know, makes sense of the popular religious practices <clears throat> as a self you know? as a thinking and as a performing self. So, because it is only by looking at how it is appreciated at that level that we can see if the, if the, if the practice of the devotion is not passive, but an active exercise of imagination, of innovation, of coping, no? of, uh, of uh, framing uh, lives in the context of a particular relationship with a divine figure. So I, I would like to lead the discussion away from, from actually using the terms uh, fanaticism because uh, we'll never know eh, using social science categories. Eh. So, but, but in terms of whether a devotion is authentic, we can actually, and, and we see it with how the devotee talks about or how the devotee makes sense of the devotion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapitola. We have one question for Dr. Tiatko. I will read it. Magandang araw po, Arlie at Yensa po ito. Ang akin pong tanong ay para sa ating unang tagapagsalita. Anong mga elemento po ang mayroon sa katolisismo at mabilis itong niyakap at inangkin ng mga ninuno natin, lalo sa anyo ng pangamanata? Maari rin pong kabalikan ang tanong ano ang mayroon sa batalismo at mabilis itong nakapasok at nakibiga, nakibagay sa dayong rehiliyon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, sige. Um, siguro masasabot ko yan. Um, natutunan naman natin sa ating um, pag-aaral ng kasaysayan kahit pa man tayo ay uh, nasa high school sinasabi ng uh, ng ating textbook ng ating mga guro na may mga elemento sa na, na tila parang hawig doon sa um, uh, relihiyon ng ating mga ninuno uh, isa doon ay yung, yung uh, o yung uh, devotion sa uh, mga uh, iba't ibang figura uh, na um, in a way, inintroduce din iyon ng katolisismo uh, umbaga na sa proseso ng adaptasyon nagkaroon siguro ng recontextualisasyon 
uh, mula sa uh, katutubong relihiyon patungo doon sa uh, uh, banyagang relihiyon na eventually yung banyagang relihiyon ay na isa um, siguro wala ko pa better term na isa Pilipino na uh, ng mga komunidad uh, yun at um, siguro yun uh, ganun ko siya masasagot uh, yung recontextual yun, nakita na may pagkakahawig uh, nakita yung performative um aspect din uh, ng katolisismo at yon ay mga inembrace ng ating mga minuno at eventually nagkaroon na nagkaroon ng proseso uh, at indigenize malamang itong uh, banyagang relihiyon salamat Thank you, Dr. Tiatko. We have another question for Dr. Sapitala. This is from Jem Javier from the Department of Linguistics. I wonder if modern online religions are already enjoying institutional recognition from the church. If so, what kinds of support have they afforded such communities? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Jem. Sa tingin ko, ano, iba-iba uh, rin kasi yung response dun sa, sa, sa modern popular religion na uh, going online. No? Uh, ako ang nakita ko dun sa fieldwork ko, um, they, parang may realization na it is a force that they have to contend with. No? Kasi ano yan, eh, parang yung, yung, yung pag-online kasi ng popular religion is a challenge for regulation. And the church is primarily a regulative institution. No? So, yung, yung kumbaga, ah, hindi nila pwedeng isang tabi. Kasi ang, ang realization na nakikita ng mga, mga religious elites at mga religious um, framers sa online religion is that kaya pansinin namin yan o hindi, people will continually, creatively use online religion for their purposes. No. And yung yung challenge din is do we stick a claim on it or not? Kasi parang ano, parang yung yung transformation din kasi ng ng religion as modern religions na mas self-conscious sa kanilang relevance. Nakita na nakita natin 'yan kasi sa konteksto ng Pilipinas uh, among Protestants and Catholic Church uh, groups, no? Um hindi na natin kasi pwedeng i-assume that the church or religion is re they will have to craft their own relevance. At nung, nung i-dinala sa platform ng online yung mga religious practices, they have to, they have to ano, the, the question is, do they uh, stick a claim on it? Kasi kung hindi, uh, they will lose that particular platform. So, to answer the question, oh, oh, actually they see it as a challenge, no? Because parang yung yung pagcraft ng relevance will have to really contend with the online platforms. Hindi na lang shrine based, hindi na lang home based. The online base is another platform that they will have to monitor and make sense of. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, our next. Our next question is for Dr. Alcantara. This is from Aaron Razol Po. Ayon po sa inyong opinion, which is the greater influence to our Philippine Christmas celebration? Spanish po or Mexican? Maraming salamat po. Ang ating Christmas celebration ay Espanyol, of course. Kaya lamang, kung dumating ang mga Mexicans dito kasama ng mga Espanyol, Siyempre, nadala dito yung kanilang uh, tradisyon na magkaroon ng Misa de Gallo at saka yung panuluyan o posadas. Kasi itong mga bagay na to hindi pwede manggaling sa Spain kasi pagka Christmas, winter time doon. Do you know that the temperature in Madrid at that time is usually 10 degrees below zero? So how could you have the Misa de Gallo and the panawagan or panuluyan at, at that season, no? at that time? 
So, ang mga Mexican siguro, nakita na, ay, pwede sa Pilipinas. Pusibling sa Mexico, hindi masyadong malamig ang weather nila, kapareho din dito. Kaya nadala dito ang ating, ang kanilang practices. As a matter of fact, hindi lang yun ang dinala ng Mexico dito. Marami pang iba. Yun sa Pasko lang yun. Sa Christmas lang yun. Pero ang origin talaga, Espanya, of course. Thank you, Dr. Alcantara. Uh... We have one question for Dr. Kiatko again from Puching Testa. Thank you for the interesting talk on the hybrid mix of Catholic and indigenous practices. Can you elaborate more on the relation of the dapo crocodile seen as a representation of our ancestors? I'm curious because in the religious accounts on the Pasig River, offerings were made to the crocodiles here in Manila. Thank you. Okay. Um Noon kasing pumasyal ako sa town uh, ng Apadi, um, part ng naratibo ng mga mamamayan doon, ng community number, yung um, ancestral worship of crocodile nga. Uh, may mga informants na nagsasabi na uh, kinukwento daw sa kanila ng mga lolo at lola nila na parati silang maglalagay ng mga bulaklak at pagkain malapit sa uh, river. Um, para hindi sila sa lakayid ng crocodile. Okay, and then eventually, uh, nabalitaan sa uh, isang kaibigan na may nag-aaral daw sa, um, sa wikang kapampangan, sa patutubong wikang kapampangan. Uh, nagkaroon ako ng interaction sa kanya at uh, napagtagni-tagni na, o nga no, ang daming mga terms sa pampanga na related sa crocodile from the po at marami kaming mga ako kasi ay kapampangan at at meron kaming mga kasabihan meron kaming mga curse word na ang starting point ay crocodile um, may mga matatanda kaming kasabihan na um, isinasabi sa mga bata na uh, kapag maiingay sila magugulo sila pag hindi kayo tumahimik dyan, kakainin kayo ng crocodile, lalabas nyo sa sapa, lalabas nyo sa idol. So, part yon ng naratibo ng mga community members. Okay? And then, um, ayun nga, um, even the priest then, uh, dati kasi ang pari uh, ay si Padre Larry Sarmiento, pero, so, uh, pero namaya, namaya pa na siya, hindi ako sure kung sino ang pumalit sa kanya bilang puro paroko uh, ng nakapalit. Pero nire-respeto din niya yung um, tawag dito, yung naratibo yun na bahagi din ng collective identity ng kapalit. Uh, so, yun. I, I mean, uh, sa tingin ko naman, sa pag-aaral din ng uh, may kaugnayan din naman yung pagbuo ng mga salita dahil nga ang mga salita ay hindi lamang mga tunog. Uh, sila ay mga mikrokosmo ng isang mundo. Uh, feeling ko naman, hindi mo bubuo yung wika, yung mararaming mga termino hinggil sa crocodile uh, doon sa may uh, Pampanga River kung hindi sa lahat sa karanasan ang mga ninuno uh, ng mga informants, lalo na yung mga matatanda uh, at ali. Ngayon kasi hindi na crocodile lang ang sinasabi nilang mga kalaban, mga kaaway, ngayon ay dahil um, ang pambaga, alam naman natin mababa, ang sinasabi nila ay ang kalaban ngayon ay yung pag-overflow ng Pampanga River. Um, so may sorogation na nagaganap from the creature to other nature, na pareho naman palang bahagi ng nature. So ayun po, sana nasagot ko po yung tanong. Thank you very much, Dr. Chatko. Now, unfortunately, we only have one more uh, time for just one more question, and this question uh, is addressed to all our speakers. So it would be nice if we ended here. Uh, this is from Lisa Dioneda, PhD, Philippine Studies at UP Diliman. I see the similarities of popular devotion in other faiths and religions. My question is if the three scholars agree that from these devo deviations in the mainstream doctrines or teachings of these religions, can we still see positive forces for social social change, Catholicism in particular? Maybe we can start with Dr. Alcantara. 
What do you want me to say? Ma Ma'am, ang tanong po ay, um, itong nakikita niyong deviations in the mainstream doctrines or teachings of these religions, can we still see positive forces for social change? Ano po tingin niyo dito? Mas, uh, ano, magiging tingin ko dyan. <laughs> ah, balikan ko kita, ma'am. Maybe we can start oh, with sige, Dr. Sapitala. Oh, Opo, sige. Dr. Sapitala? Sige, sa tingin ko, ano kasi, kailangan natin i-frame ano ba yung ibig natin sabihin ng social change. no Kasi gano'ng kalawak at gano'ng kalalim na klase ng pagbabago yung ini-expect natin o pwede natin ma-expect sa religion in general at religion in particular. Kasi sa kasaysayan, meron naman talaga mga pagkakataon na nagagamit yung popular religion no, to articulate uh, certain kumbaga, revolutionary or parang passion for change. No? Uh, posible yun. So, kumbaga, sumasabay siya dun sa repertoire ng iba pang boses calling for massive change. No? Um, sa tingin ko, sa konteksto natin ngayon, magiging ganun pa rin. No? Kapag meron isang uh, aspeto sa lipunan na tingin natin hindi maganda at hindi kaaya-aya, no? pwede natin i-frame yung resistance in religious terms. At sa ibang konteksto nga, yan pa yung nagiging ganda. Bakit? Yung, yung relevance ng, relig- ng religion ay continuous kasi ginagamit niya yung platform na yan of and resistance. Pero to say na parang religion single-handedly can, can, can bring about any kind of social change, medyo skeptical ako dyan kasi parang to, that, 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 that would mean that religion will become an independent variable na parang siya yung magiging initiator ng change. Uh, that, that happens very rarely actually. Mas, mas, mas comfortable ako dun sa metaphor ng repertoire na iba-ibang sektor talaga yung nagsasalita. Sumasama siya. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. Sapitala. Dr. Tiyato? Okay. Um, kagaya ni uh, Mano, I mean, Dr. Sapitala, um, niniwala ako na mahirap natin siyang isolate. Uh, bilang isang aspekto na siya ang gumagawa uh, ng mga pagbabago sa lipunan. Um, siguro din na screen um, ipaalala sa ating mga manunod na ako ay hindi um, social scientist per se. Uh, ang ako ay nasa field ng pag-aaral ng pagtatanghal at uh, sa disiplina namin naniniwala kami uh, na ang bawat pagtatanghal ay may efficacy, ay may action o simulain ng efficacy. Uh, ngayon, yung efficacy na yun, maaari kasi natin siyang ininya doon sa social change or of change. Um, pero hindi natin siya masasabi na ang bawat pagtatanghal na ginagawa ng mga individual ay maaari natin siyang sigupin bilang isang pagtatanghal para sa malaking um, aspect ng lipunan. Madalas yung iniisip ng mga um, magbabago ay medyo nakatuon sa pansariling intensyon. Uh, pero may mga iilang pagtatanghal na maaari natin gamitin example, pero hindi natin siya maaaring sabihin na absolute pang efficacious siya uh, to social change. Halimbawa, yun yan sa Um, sa Pampanga, may isang okasyon na ang pagtatanghal ng libad ay may temang para sa klima. Um, of course, may accidental din lang siguro yun. Um, so, ayun po. Thank you, Dr. Jato. Dr. Alcantara? Ako, masasabing ako ay medyo makaluma sapagkat hanggang ngayon, ako ay adun pa rin sa separasyon ng Estado at ng relihiyon. Maaring makapuna ang relihiyon pa minsan-minsan, pero kung minsan sa ngayon, pag ako ay nakikinig sa mga humilya ng mga pare, kung minsan ang magiging pagtulig siya sa Estado ay sobra-sobra na. Para bang... Ewan ko ba, parang, ang, parang politiko na sila kung makapaminta sa ating, uh, sa ating estado. 
Pero sa akin, bukod ang relihiyon, bukod ang estado, hindi sila pwedeng magsama. Salamat. Okay. Maraming salamat po. Once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Sapitula, Dr. Kiatko, Dr. Alcantara for sharing wonderful insights on the various expressions of piety in the Philippines. We end this morning session uh, and we go on a lunch break and we will be back at 1 p.m. for the next sessions of the day. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much to our panel one moderator, Professor Roda Wani Obias, and to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Anriel Tiatko, Dr. Manuel Sapitula, and Dr. T. Alvira. Pagkiriwang will be taking a break for lunch. We will be back at 1 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. Please check your screens for the schedule of our afternoon panel sessions. Again, we will be back at 1 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. Thank you and see you in an hour. <laughs>